Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our virtual roundtable where we talk about uh, all matters concerning the Beatles, uh, their history, their present, their future, whatever whatever we can come up with. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from uh, Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. First of all, the, uh, the, the host of the syndicated uh, and rapidly growing Beatles uh, radio show uh, every little thing uh, and that's ken michaels hi ken hi al how you doing good how about you very good. um and our resident uh, musicologist just back from a uh, from a concert yesterday that he uh, that he just reviewed and uh the long time uh, long time classical music reviewer for uh, for the new york times and also the author of the beatles from the cavern to the rooftop and the book about about i want to hold your hand that i'm just blanking out on <laughs> and the title got that of which something. is got that got something, that something. How the Beatles want to hold your hand changed everything. Right. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Al. How are you doing? And hello, everybody. And uh, last but certainly not least, the uh, as Alan calls him, the uh, the world's uh, the world's only remaining full time uh, <laughs> Beatles journalist, uh, and he uh, writes for uh, for Billboard and for Axes AXS dot com, and I think sometimes to still the Hollywood Reporter and uh, various other places, and that's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, uh, Al. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I should mention that two days from now is the anniversary of the death of Davy Jones, of which I have a book yes, called. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I got to get that in. Sorry, Mean a Monkey, Davy Jones. There we go. And yeah, uh, that was five. Was that five years ago already? Uh, yes, it was. It'll be wow. five years. Uh, time is just passing by ridiculously fast yeah mm-hmm. really a little a little too fast because yeah. that seems like it was the day before yesterday yeah mm. i could say that Any... about a lot of things <laughs> well this is <laughs> this is very true yeah. <laughs> very true uh, we have uh, we have one uh discussion topic that we're going to be getting into but first uh we have some a uh, little bit of news but also as i mentioned alan yesterday uh, uh went to see a concert which uh was um it was the portland symphony uh in uh, doing a um, at least the first half of the concert was a symphonic version of sergeant pepper and the second half was uh, various and sundry orchestral arrangements of Beatles songs. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> is, yeah. that an af- is that an afternoon you uh, <laughs> well, you know, you actually, wish you had back? <laughs> um, I should, to clarify, what, what they did is they had a rock band on stage with them. And so, oh. um, you know, it was meant to be pretty much faithful renditions of the Beatles arrangements of all of these songs, including all of Sgt. Pepper. And as I said in my review, which you can find on my Facebook page, because I put everything up there, uh, probably by the time this runs, you might have to scroll down a bit. I generally, okay, I I said in the review that, uh, you know, for me, this was sort of going to be a test, because while on one hand, I love Sgt. Pepper and think the Beatles are the zenith of Western Civ, On the other Mm -hmm. hand, I really loathe orchestral pops concerts. I love orchestra concerts. I mean, as as someone who is also a classical music reviewer in real life, um, Mm -hmm. that's what I go to. Orchestral pops, to me, just always are, you know, from an orchestra goer's point of view, they're just cheesy. And from a rock lover's point of view, they're always kind of defanged, um, you know, not very good versions a little musacky and you know you know why bother now mm-hmm. the conductor of this one um jeffrey reed who has an orchestra in uh tennessee i believe has been building a reputation for doing faithful 
covers of lots of great rock stuff. Last year, he came to Portland with the same band and joined the Portland Symphony for the complete Pet Sounds and then Beach Boy songs on the second half of the concert. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't get to, I really wanted to go to that, but I wasn't able to because I had to be out of town covering something else for someone else. And so I missed that. But, you know, now I don't feel so bad about missing it because <laughs> what I expected to happen but how I expected this concert would finally convince me that maybe symphonic pops concerts are not the dopey, artistically worthless things that I've always thought they were, was that I expected that when he said that they would be doing Sgt. Pepper, that they would be treating Sgt. Pepper the way they would treat a Beethoven symphony. In other words, you play it from start to finish, you play all the notes, you, you know, you do it as it is. Mm -hmm. What was immediately clear after a little help from my friends was that the conductor was going to stop and turn around and talk to the audience in between just about every song. I mean, he didn't do it. He also left from Good Morning, Good Morning to A Day in the Life Alone. But every single song otherwise, he turned around and talked to the audience. Now, you wouldn't get that in a Beethoven symphony or, a, you know. Right. And, and most of the things he had to say kind of were not worth breaking the spell of Sgt. Pepper, where, you know, everybody listening knows the album. Right? I mean, you know, those songs go from one to the next. Mm -hmm. And you expect, you know, when getting better ends, you expect it, it's just they go into each other like symphonic movements. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, this is going to be great because it's it will be treating Sgt. Pepper with the respect it deserves. But it turned out to be just another other dopey orchestral pops concert and treating Sgt. Pepper as just another bunch of Beatles songs, not as a sort of unified whole. Now, we can argue whether it really is a unified whole in the concept album and all that stuff. And, you know, we've done that. And, and I don't think it really is a concept album necessarily in the way that, you know, Tommy is. But... It is in the sense that they, they carefully sequence those songs. They did the British pressing in any case without banding between songs. So clearly mm -hmm. the intention was this is like a show, you know, of the Sgt. Pepper band, you know, and you play it from start to finish and you listen to it. And I thought this is really the way it should be. And it wasn't. And so that was really intensely disappointing. And, and so I had to beat him over the head a bit. Um, partly... <laughs> But, well, partly because it's my job and also partly, um, sure. let us say, prophylactically, <laughs> because, <laughs> because <laughs> he is planning to do the same thing with Abbey Road or at least, at least make an arrangement of all of Abbey Road, which is the mm. other Beatle album that's most likely to survive orchestration. Right. I mean, as you know, on Sgt. Pepper, it's not all orchestrated and mm -hmm. so stuff that he did is not really on Sgt. Pepper. And in those cases, you know, the, the rock band still was out front as the Beatles would have been, but he added some textural filler to give the string players and, and the orchestra something to do. But it was, you know, not intrusive and it was tastefully done. With Abbey Road, I mean, especially side two, I mean, that can be incredible. And uh, mm -hmm. but he but he has to sort of play it and shut up. Or as Frank Zappa, you know, put it in an album title, shut up and play your guitar. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm hoping, you know, that he takes this to heart and, you know, and, and also he might be able to rethink his Sgt. Pepper thing, too, because, you know, Jeffrey Reed takes this show around the country. It's, he just happened to come to Portland this weekend, but he plays it with other orchestras all over the place. And what I suggested was, you know, if he had to really had to chat between songs um, and some of which was practical, he wanted to introduce the guys in his bands and who was singing and et cetera for each song. The way to do that is to make the second half of the program the first half, right? So mm -hmm. they've got just a bunch of miscellaneous songs and they did a lot. It was mostly post pepper. They did. I am the walrus magical mystery tour, Penny lane for the pre pepper stuff. It was just, you know, the obvious things you would guess they would do yesterday in Eleanor Rigby because sure. of the stringer. 
Um, you know, and Long and Winding Road they did and Let It Be. Uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, the guitarist was not really quite Eric Clapton, but mm-hmm. you know, they did a, a reasonable version. And, um, you know, basically they should have made that the first half. Then he could introduce the players between songs because those songs don't have to run together uninterrupted. I'd rather they did. But if he has to chat, has to introduce the band, you know, maybe someday someone will invent something like, oh, I don't know, program notes that could, you know, give people this info. But if he has to chat, that's the way to do it. Do it on the first half and then Mm -hmm. on the second half, play Sergeant Pepper uninterrupted. So, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, unless he just, you know, takes such umbrage at the review that, you know, he's not going to do it. Maybe he'll rethink this presentation as he goes around the country and uh, and does it that way instead. But, you know, no one listens to critics. So this is this is true. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say, Alan? I said no one listens to critics. So, <laughs> you know, we heard from uh, we heard from Denny Sewell a couple of weeks ago what, mm. <laughs> yeah. what they do with critics. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, this is true. So uh, that was a sort of pepper thing. Uh, you know, I had hoped it would be much better than it was, mm. um, but alas, you know. Yeah, I mean it, the con- the concept sounds sounds real good, but the execution obviously was not. Uh, not up to snuff. Right. Alan, you you probably have, as I do, several versions of symphonic treatments of, of Pepper. Do you, does any off the top of your... I can't remember. I mean, I don't have my collection right here where I can look at it, but I mean, is there any that you can think of offhand that were that good? Uh, no, I mean, I can't think of... I, I've got symphonic collections of various Beatles things, but um, mm-hmm. I don't think I have a symphonic version of Pepper. You mm. know, there are lots of other covers of Pepper, you know, ranging from Big Daddy to right. you know, mm-hmm. various, various things. You know, even I think Mojo probably has put together a compilation of various artists covering oh, sure. all the songs. You know, I mean, someone said on, on my in the discussion after the review in my Facebook page that... The Beatles sound itself was so crucial to why we like the stuff that that's why you never hear covers of Sgt. Pepper. Well, you know, he never heard covers of Sgt. Pepper. I've heard covers of Sgt. Pepper. Oh, sure. You -hmm. know, and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously everyone probably prefers the Beatles' original versions of all their stuff, but there are some really good covers of everything out there. And uh, Sure, sure. Yeah, but but symphonic yeah. stuff generally. I mean, I just I'm not I'm not crazy about symphonic versions of Beatles things. I mean, I've got all right. the Holly Ridge strings things and George Martin's orchestra and all that, and you know they're entertaining and you know. Yeah, but those are those are guilty pleasures of mine. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but, uh, I I can't imagine actually a, apart from if I had some work related reason to put them on. I can't imagine actually putting them on but um yeah, yeah you know there uh, there I, I just was looking up on amazon just to see what i could find and there is one that they show and i and actually i think it's changed a little bit since it originally came out it's called orchestral sergeant pepper by the royal academy of music with mm. david palmer but mm. david palmer has since become a woman yeah d uh, palmer um, right and, but anyway, but but that album, as I recall, is very good. It's very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll have to look into it. Yeah, it's on Amazon for like three bucks used. This was supposed to be not a you know recreation, as in like they you know they weren't wearing Sgt. Pepper costumes or they were doing it sure. as as if it was you know a great piece of musical literature, which it is, except that. They didn't do it as if it was a great piece of musical literature as it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a pity. I mean, the, the the arrangements, though, were were generally speaking faithful. And also some of the stuff that he had to say in between was, you know, was just wrong. It was like, you know, turned around and said, uh, you know, George Martin did all their arrangements. All right. All the, you know, you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really true. I mean, two of the songs he played had orchestral arrangements by other than George Martin. She's Leaving Home was arranged by Mike Leander because Mm -hmm. George Martin was busy and Paul didn't want to wait. And uh, Long and Winding Road was arranged by Richard Hewson, Mm -hmm. which is really an interesting thing because, you know, of, of, of all the Beatles recordings, the one that Paul has been the most apoplectic about has been what Phil Spector did to Long and Winding Road. Mm -hmm. 
and that was Richard Hewson. And yet, right. like two years later, Paul hired none other than Richard Hewson to do the thrilling today. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so I yeah. guess he's you know more forgiving than people sometimes give him credit for. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is true. Very we true. could we could get into a whole discussion about things like Hollywood strings, which really are are not really classical. I mean, that's no, really, they're right. they're easy. You know what was easy M-O-R. listening? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Back back in in the sixties, you know, definitely the kind of stuff that was played on what they called beautiful music radio stations. Right there, I mean, there uh, are some good classical renditions of the Beatles. That one. Um, uh, was it Akira Takahashi, Alan? Is that the one? Uh, Aki Takahashi. Aki well, Ta- those were, yeah. What, what, I mean, what she did was she commissioned composers to do their takes on Beatles songs. And so they were all a little bit avant-garde and weird, too. You know, I but mean, that's, John. I mean, that's naturally good. That's yeah. That's a great CD. Yeah, and she did like four volumes of it, and and she's a great new music pianist. So yeah, that was a great project. And also, I, I think I've mentioned in the past too, uh, one of the very earliest things, Joshua Rifkin's Baroque Beatles book, uh, came oh, out in, in yeah 1966, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and basically yep. treated the Beatles things. Uh, he orchestrated them as if they were Handel and Bach. Yep. And you know, and did such a persuasive job that. You know, I used to have friends over, friends of mine from the classical world over for dinner and put that album on. (laughs) And it would take people a really long time to realize that there was something a little unusual. What what is that melody? (laughs) That melody sounds familiar. Yeah. Interesting. uh, Interesting. mm -hmm. Now, in the same vein, um, this uh, this past weekend was the uh, 74th anniversary of the the uh, birth of George Harrison. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Kenneth mentioned that there was a uh, a George Harrison tribute concert that he was interested in talking about. Yeah, I wish I could have gone to this one. It actually took place on Long Island. It was called the Concert for Bangladesh Revisited. And mm-hmm. this is a show that gets put, has been put on for the last several years. There's a band called Wondrous Stories, who takes their name from the Yes song. And um, they not only have covered Yes, and do a, they're a Yes tribute band, but they've also done a lot of Beatles. And Kenny Forgione is uh, the main member of the group. And um, he puts this thing together, and they had it over the weekend. And not only did they play the songs from the concert for Bangladesh and other George Harrison songs, Solo and Beatles. But they had special guests on stage, which included Danny Lane, Mm -hmm. Steve Holly, Marshall Crenshaw, um, and John Murjavi was there playing Mm -hmm. with them. He really gets around. (laughs) Yeah, he certainly does. (laughs) I mean, he's he's in Liverpool, the house band at the Fest for Beatles fans. He's in the Weeklings, and he was also in this band. And also a really good friend of mine who used to be my co-host on the radio when I first started on college radio, Ed Ryan, who does mm-hmm. a lot of performing in the New York area and Long Island. And he got to go on stage with these people, which was the thrill of a lifetime. I mean, uh, I've known Ed since I started doing my Beatles show in 1982. And he was very familiar with all the solo music. It was a thrill for him. We got to see Denny Lane in concert a few months ago, so we got to meet Denny. He was over the moon over this and here he is on stage now with with denny lane and steve holly <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it's like my god mm-hmm. so not only is he uh you know a, a great musician um he's a major fan so mm-hmm. i know i know uh may pang was in the audience for this but um mm-hmm. he puts on this show every single year around george's birthday and so he's going to continue to do this or try to do this and invite special guests uh every year so uh Wish I could have gone, but it sounds like a real dynamite show. Yeah, sounds sounds real interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Um, and we do have a couple of uh, couple of news items. Uh, Ken mentioned the fact that, uh, and possibly some of you may have uh, may have seen this online, that in the the new version of I Me Mine, the new edition of I Me Mine, uh, there's a page in which there are some handwritten lyrics for for a song called Hey Ringo mm. which nobody seems to know anything about right Ken Yeah and I've actually seen the lyrics it's it's not very lengthy 
But it sounds mm-hmm. like something that George and Ringo wrote together. Now, I could be wrong about this because the first verse sounds like George is writing his feelings about Ringo, that, you know, he always wants to have him drum for him. And then Ringo, it just seems like the next verse is Ringo responding to George. You know, so I don't know if that's a fact, if it's the two of them writing it together. But I know that this was published last year. So we don't really know the extent of whether or not there ever was a full song for this. But it's mm-hmm. kind of interesting that, that this was even attempted. It sounds like a solo Beatles version of I Got You, Babe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my oh. God. Who knows? You know, you watch Groundhog's Day in February and it gets in your head. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Who knows? Maybe it was written for the Ogner Rats uh, <laughs> special. Who knows? But, you know, there was a there was an exhibit in Los Angeles over the weekend. And mm-hmm. one of our listeners actually uh, posted something on Facebook and he he posted photos from the exhibit of the handwritten lyrics of George's songs. And mm-hmm. apparently, because somebody wrote to him, one of our listeners wrote to him asking if it was facsimiles or not. And he's saying, and this is Matt Wilsinski, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. He's saying mm-hmm. they're the real deals. Mm-hmm. The it's handwritten possible. lyrics. So There's no way to really tell, you know. Yeah. You know, if you go into Carnegie Hall and you... Look, walk down there the hallway along the side of the first floor. You see all of these manuscripts framed on the wall, and they all are weathered in different kinds of coloration and all that stuff. But they mm-hmm. are all facsimiles, very, very, very good facsimiles, which they decided to make actually only a few years ago when someone stole a bunch of the real ones and they found the box of them in, in uh, I think, um, Riverside Park. Oh, and they really? recovered them, but then they they decided, okay, we can't leave these things up, the real ones up publicly. So they they you know went to painstaking effort to make them look real. But you know, given that that can be done, it's hard to say in an exhibition what's real and what's not at this point. Yeah, and I'm mm-hmm. reminded it, of the fact that on um, some of Paul McCartney's remasters, he has facsimiles of his handwritten mm-hmm. lyrics, and they look like right. he just wrote them. I mean, right. <laughs> it looks that good. Yeah. 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 And if you remember the uh, the John Lennon exhibit that uh, that Yoko put on, uh, I'm now forgetting where it was in New York. At the um, Rock and Roll Muse- Hall of that Fame was Museum. It. Yes, yeah. that mm. was it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and um, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know whether those you know, those song lyric sheets were facsimiles of the originals either. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. At the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in, in Cleveland, they had a whole floor of it. Sure. Yeah. Of just that, of handwritten lyrics. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe they are. I'm just saying that there's, there, it's it's hard to know, you know, because for security reasons. Of course. They may not be. Yeah. Hmm. Very, very possible. Very possible. Mm-hmm. So, if we don't have any uh, any further news uh, of any great interest, we can move on to uh, to our our, our topic. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this is something that uh, that Ken came up with uh, through uh, through one of his friends. Yeah, his name is Michael Grassafoli. He lives in New Jersey, and he's a regular listener of this show. Mm-hmm. He's going to be freaking out once he hears me even mention his name here, <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that we're using his idea. But he came up with this question for me of what he wanted us to talk about what we think all four of the Beatles would be best known for for their solo careers in the world. How the world would look at each of the four of them. If if we could pick one thing from each of the four Beatles for what they would be known for from their solo careers, it could be a song, it could be an album, it could be an event, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. It could be an overview if you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. What would it be? So I thought, okay. um, you know, that'd be because of the fact that it was really difficult for me to come up with with something for each of the four because they've given us so much. I thought sure. it would be a really good uh, question for us to tackle. Mm-hmm. I thought, yeah, I think it's a I think it's an interesting topic. Mm. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each beetle and go kind of around the uh, as I call it the virtual around the horn. Uh, yeah, <laughs> around the horn. Uh-huh. Exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. And I think we'll start with uh, we'll start with John, and I think I'll start uh, because I think maybe I'm taking a slightly different tack in that um, I'm using actually in in the case of each each beetle a word to hmm. describe. You know okay. how the how the world may look on uh, on their 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 post Beatles career, and in John's case, the word would be activism, because after all, um, you know from the very beginning of you know his of his solo of his yeah of his solo career, uh, even before actually the uh, the breakup of the Beatles, he recorded uh, he wrote and recorded "Give Peace a Chance," which uh, within just a couple of months after uh, it was released had become a, uh, you know, a major anthem for, uh, for the peace movement. Mm. And, and he continued to show, uh, he can continued to be in deeply involved with social activism for much of the, the, the first half of the, uh, of the seventies, particularly in, um, in, well, at least in England in, in 1970 and 71, really more specifically 71. And, uh, and then of course in 1972, when he, uh, <laughs> frankly got involved with uh, with Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman and and that uh, group of publicity hungry radical chic people, but still his his inclinations as a as a, a, you know as he so called himself a peacenik, mm-hmm. you know were very much very much to the fore. Obviously, songs like like Power to the People, it's so hard. I don't want to be a soldier. Uh, give me some truth. Uh, and any, of course, the in, virtually the entire album of uh, Sometime in New York City, whatever one may think of that. Um, <laughs> I you know, love his, it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's yeah. It, okay. You know, it it has its it has its good points. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think his I think John's activism uh, is um, uh, is is what I think the world probably remembers about him, maybe more than anything else. Uh, you know, even to the point in some of the interviews that um, that he did in uh, in in the fall of 1980, uh, while he kind of poo pooed that period there in '72, he still, you could tell, was still definitely he had you know very definite views mm-hmm. about the about the world and about the uh, the you know the the political spectrum. In fact, people, <laughs> unfortunately, people keep speculating with you know absolutely you know nothing to base it on uh on you know where a john lennon would be today politically which is you know absolutely impossible to speculate on because you're talking about for one thing 36 and a half years later and and also a man who was so chameleon like and so multi-layered and could turn on a dime as far as his his thinking uh, so uh you know it's just impossible to speculate on what what john lennon where john lennon's politics would be today but anyway uh i i think activism is what the uh is what the world would be would be would remember him most for in a nutshell okay and uh ken why don't we uh why don't we uh, uh get your Get your take. Boy, after what you just said, Al, I'm I'm thinking we got to make a show out of that. <laughs> oh, actually, I think we did. <laughs> well, maybe more in depth just on John. But anyway, as much as I would like for the world to know all of his solo music, I think he's going to best be known for the song Imagine. Mm-hmm. Mainly because of the fact that it's not just a classic, but so many people have covered it. It's used in commercials. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Yoko is always pushing the song, so it's always mm-hmm. used for, for campaigns of some kind, whether it's amnesty, whatever. Everybody knows the song Imagine. I would love for everyone to know the rest of his catalog, but that's the one that he's best known for. I think if I was to pick a signature song from him, while I love so many other songs, and some songs more than Imagine, I just think everybody knows Imagine, and it's always going to be covered. And it's always going to be used for some purpose, 
in the future, more so probably than any other John Lennon solo song. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, like I said, I think that he had, uh, while it was a very short career, uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. his, songs, his songs are extremely powerful. Most of them are for me. But Imagine mm-hmm. is the one that resonates with most people. People, even people who are familiar with this whole catalog, love the song. The people who are not as familiar, everybody knows that song. So um, sure. I think I'd have to pick that one song from them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very valid. Alan? <laughs> yeah, th- this, is, this is a really hard assignment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See what I mean? Really? Yeah. I kind of, I you know, and I kind of agree with both of you <laughs> so far. But um, I, th- I was thinking more along the terms of what Al said. You know, the activism, the the fact, you know, people, I think will remember. You know, keeping in mind we're so we're talking about what the world will remember, not what we individually think. But I, I think people will remember him as a symbol of um, uh, sort of rock star activism um, and. Uh, peace nicking, um, mm-hmm. you know, because that that was a really crucial part of his career, and probably probably the thing that uh, you know not only people knew most of the time, but you know that, that gets brought up most often. I mean, the the U.S. versus John Lennon film that came exactly. out not yeah. so long ago. I mean, it was mm-hmm. well after he died, and mm-hmm. probably a lot of people who saw it didn't really know that much about other aspects of his career, you know, and, and, and because of that, you know, because of things like the involvement with, you know, immigration and all that, because of Nixon trying to, and his guys trying to throw John out of the country mm-hmm. as a troublemaker, you know, that actually, it, it ended up sort of taking over a whole lot of his life. Exactly. Um, you know, and I think also musically, it, it sort of accounts for some of the best and worst of, 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 of his stuff from the period, too. I mean, give peace a chance while not, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, the most brilliant musical piece he ever did, uh, mm-hmm. nevertheless caught everybody's imagination immediately. And as you said, it became an anthem. And, right. uh, you know, I was funny. I was talking to this Russian pianist, you know, who sort of you know, <laughs> came from came from Russia, moved to New York and, you know, took a very Russian point of view about government control and all that stuff. And he said, you know, you guys really don't think that you ended the war in Vietnam, do you? And I said, yeah, you know, you have to understand, everybody was out there singing Give Peace a Chance all mm-hmm. over the country all the time. And yeah, you know, it, it did have an effect. I believe it had an effect. I mean, maybe he knows more about how governments work than I do. And, uh, you know, at least at the time, the Russian and American governments weren't uh, you know, so close. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think it I think that song had a huge galvanizing effect for people and. You know, mm-hmm. and and a lot of his other songs of the time were, you know, very, you know, they caught the spirit of the time. I, I, I wasn't crazy about some time in New York. I thought those songs were sort of half baked. And that was that was the aesthetic he was going for, you know, that it's journalism. We just go into the studio, do it right out next. But I kind of think if I think if he had baked it a little longer, those songs would have been better, you know. But yeah, so I'll go with activism. And turn it over to what Steve, I guess. Steve, right? yep, mm. yep. Well, my thinking is kind of along the same lines as you, Al, and you, Alan. Um, but I think I went a little wider. Um, I was thinking that back in the '60s, when John started, well, actually, in the I should say in the '70s, when John and Yoko started their peace campaigns and you know did the bed ins and everything like that. Mm-hmm. They were one of the first, if I don't know, I wouldn't, I, well, I wasn't going to say the first, and they, they probably, probably weren't, but they were one of the first to go really public with their political beliefs, and that gets into what Alan said about activism, but I think it was it's more than that. I think the idea of crusading the way they did, maybe, and maybe I'm on the same wavelength as you guys, um, but but it really, for me... They really pioneered, both him and Yoko pioneered the whole political activism thing because it really wasn't 
that strong among people before they started doing that and they wow. the bed the uh. bed ins the bed ins <laughs> the working for peace the songs the songs i mean the songs were all that was all part of it but the thing is that now 36 years after he's gone it's still going on and yoko is still carrying on in his name mm-hmm. um and and the idea of what john would be doing now i I'm pretty certain. I think you can kind of guess what he would have been doing. Not really. But I, 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 mm. I think so. It's, I, I, I really, the theories that he would have been conservative are just malarkey. He would not have been. He would not. Have been. I could see uh, both points of view here, but I also think that he and Yoko were so much together on every issue. You know, right. however Yoko feels about anything today, I think is pretty much how John would. Exactly. I agree, and, uh, and and you know, and and uh, it's just it's that way. So, but yeah, I think the whole uh, the political thing they both pioneered that. Well, I, well, I think I, I you think, were gonna you were gonna object to what I said, Al. What were you? Yeah, gonna say? because I think a, a lot of people that were uh, that were involved with the civil rights movement in the early '60s, well, I mean, and was, and people a, a and people who were who were involved with the and I'm talking about entertainers. Okay. Who were who were involved with uh, with the with the peace campaign uh, early on? Give me a couple of names that you're thinking of. The Smothers Brothers, you know. They <laughs> they lost it. They lost the TV show because they uh, because of their uh, of their activism. Yeah. What about Peter Paul and Mary? What about Peter pa- Joan Baez? Dylan. 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 Sure. Yeah. And Dylan. Sure. Well, I, I, I you know, yeah. Were... I, okay. I'll I'll can you know I'll concede that those names did have you know did uh, Dylan especially. I I mean you can't ignore what Dylan did. And you can't shove that to the side. But they they took it, I think, to a higher level with, especially with the bed ins with the well with the events, yeah, right. That's true. And they, I and I think and I think that's the, the that's the point there um, that they you know that's what they did. So I think mm-hmm. for that reason, you know, they I mean, uh, you know, Yoko, like I said, is still doing it today with the wish tree and the whole thing, and, and you know. She's uh, she's amazing. I'm, I'm you know I know we've been talking about doing a Yoko show, but yeah, I mean that, so, that's soon. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's that, that's amazing. I I just think she is you know and and uh, yeah. So anyway, there we go. Okay. I should, can I just add that if yeah. we were going to you know since we're talking about what the world is going to um, remember them for um, the the album mentioned most frequently on this show is of course Life with the Lions and um, <laughs> oh of course so, <laughs> I, I knew you did. <laughs> I had to I had to sure you did but you know to to um, kind of counter what you guys are are, are saying here well I can certainly see why you feel the activism probably is what he might be best known for but i'm thinking of the more casual mainstream person out there that may not know all that history but everybody knows imagine mm-hmm. you know so that's just uh, why think, i you say. know I and actually when you think about it imagine is really even tied in with uh, yeah, with his activism yeah, because the you know it's the whole philosophy of, of you know it's a, it's a you know utopian dream of uh, you know of a song but still it's it's kind of tied in with uh, with his with his activism and his hope for a better a better world right i mm-hmm. think you can i think you can go I mean, there's arguments to be made from both sides, but I think uh, while the song "Imagine" sticks out, and it's the it's the song that that you know will go through the media every time you hear you know that somebody's talking about John. I think history will remember the activism more than the than the song. I believe because of the way because of the effects. I think that's uh, if we're looking for a historical angle. Mm-hmm. I think you have to you have to give it to the uh, to the activism. Okay. In a way, I hope you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You hope I'm right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Write that down. I'm never going to say this again on the show. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rarity. Yes. Uh, let's move on to George Harrison. 
And um, my one word that I think he's going to be best remembered for is musicality. <laughs> he was uh, he was always kind of the most musical of of the Beatles. And he, um, you know, in his, uh, basically almost as soon as the Beatles had ceased to exist, at least unofficially, he, you know, was spreading his wings into, into different areas and with, you know, musical friends, particularly. After all, his, you know, his best friend was Eric Clapton. Who you know was uh, you know not uh, you know not someone from you know from everything that's known of his reputation was not the uh, not the easiest person to get to know and yet uh, they were uh, the, you know, they were best friends uh, through uh, through an awful lot in the last you know thirty some years of uh, of George's life and as I said in uh, in December of sixty nine really just after the Beatles had more or less ceased to exist with, uh, with Eric Clapton, he, uh, uh, George went out on tour with the Laney and Bonnie. And then in the, sp- in that spring, right after Paul made the, made the breakup pretty much public knowledge, George headed to, uh, headed to New York to, uh, uh, to spend time with, uh, with Bob Dylan. And throughout the 70s and, uh, and 80s, um, he continued to have, he, was, he had this kind of community of musical friends. You know, he was really, he was very much immersed in, in music and he surrounded himself. He was most comfortable with people like, you know, uh, people like Dylan, people like the members of the band, uh, people... Uh, like Ry Cooter and Billy Preston and and Jim Keltner and the obviously his uh, his uh, his Indian music uh, guru, if you want to call him that, Ravi Shankar. Mm-hmm. So he, you know, he was very much immersed in in music, and I think much more so than the other than really the other three, at least until Ringo cleaned himself up. And began going out with the the all star band and made it you know made it known that he just felt very comfortable being with a being with a band and being with a group of musicians like the you know like the current band that he's been with for so long because he just likes these guys and likes them as musicians and likes them as people and that was the case with uh, with George and uh, you know that that coterie of uh, musicians Klaus Vormann you know Jeff Lynne Tom Petty uh, the members of obviously and 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 even artists that he had known for you know a goodly a good long time going back to the Beatle days uh, people like Roy Orbison people like Joe Brown you know he continued to have uh, you know an ongoing friendship with with these guys for you know for a very long time so he really really was kind of like a a musician's musician and obviously that was you know shown in in spades in uh, you know a year after george passed with the uh, with the concert for george and the you know the regard that all of these these great musicians had for George as, you know, as a person and as a musician. Hmm. So, so I think, uh, overall, that's what he'll, he'll be best remembered for is, is musicality. Ken? It's hard to bounce off that one, Al. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I, I don't, I kind of had a problem with the way that you introduced, uh, that, that description of musicality because, I do think of Paul and George as being the most eclectic of the, of the Beatles as far as all the different styles of music that they explored. I would say, yeah, I think George was more of a a collaborator with other musicians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe maybe that would be a better word, but Paul mm-hmm. Paul has worked with a lot of musicians over the years, whether they were all in Wings or some studio people or you know, all the ones on his different albums. He's worked with a lot of different people. 
So, mm-hmm. and uh, when you think of musicality, I think of all the different musical styles that Paul has done, which I think is more than just about anybody that I know in music. And George is, is pretty close to Paul in that regard, although he's not known for it. But I think you're dealing more with the humanity aspect of George and the fact that he has so many friends who are loyal to him and for good reason. And mm-hmm. you watch the um, Living in the Material World documentary, you certainly get that vibe from all mm-hmm. those friends of his, how much they really love that man. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I can see that aspect, the humanity of it, the collaborations, that I would agree with. You know, this is, as, as I said, all four of the Beatles are very tough to narrow down to one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that among so many Beatle fans, they look at All Things Must Pass as, you know, probably the greatest solo Beatle album. And while there's one that I like more than that, uh, <laughs> you know, I would never argue with anyone who, who recognized that as being a masterpiece. But I think that George might be better known for the concert for Bangladesh than anything else because it was the first charity concert of its kind, because of all mm-hmm. the different musicians that were a part of it. Those were all stellar people. Obviously, Bob Dylan, Ringo was there, uh, Leon Russell, who was really hot at the time, Billy Preston, members of Badfinger. You know, it was such an incredible concert. And a lot of people point to that as one of the greatest concerts ever. And, um, you know, just the fact that you had all those different people playing their own music in many cases, playing it all together. It was just uh, an incredible moment that a lot of people point to. And whereas I love all of just about everything George has done on his albums, all of his songs, it's it's tough for me not to pick a song or an album. But this event was so huge, and I think it's only grown in stature through the years. So um, I think if I was to pick one thing of them all, and God, with George, you got so many things. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, sure. um, I would pick the concert for Bangladesh most of all. Mm-hmm. And if you if you really think about it, actually, the the concert for Bangladesh and how it all fell together so quickly uh, actually plays into what I was saying because a lot of those you know the guys that were uh, that were involved with the concert for Bangladesh mm. were again in that coterie of, uh, of friends of musical friends that in a you know in a different age you would have said that he you know that George would have had on speed dial mm. you yeah. know so you know he was able to you know contact these these guys at a, you know at almost at an instant mm-hmm. and they you know immediately said yeah sure we'll do it you know right. even e- even Eric Clapton who was in the uh, yeah. in the throat in the throes of heroin addiction and Dylan who was in the midst of his uh, what you might call his Howard Hughes period you know when he he was he had become a uh, you know a recluse and wasn't doing concerts you know even he came out and i think that's uh mm-hmm. again that's a reflection of the the regard that they all had for the that they all had for george that's an excellent point right there that makes it even yeah. more special yeah that was the exactly. first concert since when for dylan uh the first one since the isle of white in uh september of 69 mm-hmm. well that just proves that point yeah know, of how important that's george it. was and how much they thought of him exactly exactly Alan, how about you? Well, I think um, Isle of Wight was like August 31st, 69. <laughs> Just a, sorry. Okay. Um, but, um, <laughs> right. But on to George. Um, yeah, you know, actually, I, I can, it's very funny. I, I considered um, originally I was thinking the consulate for Bangladesh was going to be my choice. But then before the show when we were talking and Ken convinced me that it the topic was about what the world will remember, um, I thought, OK, I, I have to retool my point of view here because I, I don't know if the world will remember that or not. I mean, I agree with everything Ken said about it. Um, but what I think the world will remember about George um, in a way, I think, is the spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because, I mean, cause, because that became a really important part of his persona and came out through 
an awful lot of his music. I mean, you could say almost all of his music post Beatles, you know, starting with all things must pass. And, uh, and there are aspects of it on brainwashed, you know, and everything in between. Um, obviously he had some other topics he was interested in discussing too, in his songs, but, um, but the, the pervasive spirituality, it was also something that he talked about in interviews a lot, you know, about how unimportant all of this, you know, physical world was and how it was about something more than that. Um, and then just projecting that idea that, that, you know, you're here for a reason and you should do something to sort of find out what the reason is and pursue it, you know, in a way, like with John's activism, it, it was something a little unusual for pop stars, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, there's like the Amy Grant world where, you know, it's, that kind of thing in a way too but it's not that kind of you know this was a different Mm -hmm. this was a a different approach and a different philosophy and so anyway that's uh that's that's what i think and you know and and to respond to that probably more (laughs) importantly is the fact that george was consistent throughout his whole life Mm -hmm. talking about spirituality up to the end saying Mm -hmm. those exact same words that you said alan you know Mm -hmm. yeah so very true there you go okay steve well i kind of agree with alan um but i think i went a little further i agree about the spirituality aspect but my thinking is that the one thing that he did starting with my sweet lord was make god hip um because no, seriously, I think I think that's true because I think there wasn't, and I'm trying I'm trying to think back now. Um, you know, there there were a few songs um, that um, that celebrated spirituality and religion. You know, back then, I, I unfortunately I didn't get a list of them, but there were there were songs. I mean. Um, you know, you've got the whole world. He's got the whole world in his hand. Is one that just comes to mind off the top. But my sweet lord, you know, actually, just I mean, laid it out there, and and even you know had. I mean, the the words were were all about that. And it's not just that. It's not just. I mean, give me love, give me peace on earth. What is life? All things must pass. I mean, it was all. His philosophy was all through his music. And even a song like All Those Years Ago, which wasn't really about God, had a little bit of spirituality in it. It it was just all through his music. So I think, you know, more than anything, that's the overriding thing. I think I seriously did consider making Concert for Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, I have no argument on the fact that he was forerunner on making you know uh, rock benefit shows uh, mm-hmm. no question no question about that but i think overall even bigger he um the the spirituality thing was what people will remember him for more than anything mm-hmm. very very possible hmm. very 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 possible these are all good answers mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. Next, let's go with. Uh, I'm going to save Paul for last because that's that's going to be the toughest one. So let's let's go with Ringo. And uh, my my word that I would use that I think uh, that I think people will kind of remember Ringo for is resiliency. You know, you're talking about someone who, uh, let's face it, when he was uh, when he was a child. He was, uh, you know, given up for dead uh, a couple of times. He spent a good amount of his time in uh, in hospitals, mm. uh, and yet he uh, uh, survived all that. became uh, became a musician, became a star in Liverpool, and then, of course, became the final piece of the puzzle for for the Beatles. But then, when that came apart. A lot of people were very, including the Beatles, the other three Beatles were concerned about how Ringo would fare in his uh, uh, in his post Beatles career. And at least for the first uh, the first six years, he did spectacularly well. 
Mm-hmm. You know, with a with a whole with a, a string of hit singles and uh, and two very very successful uh, albums in uh, Ringo and, and uh, Good Night Vienna, uh, then he had a uh, you know a downturn in his uh, in his fortunes, no doubt about it. Even to the point where in the early eighties. Uh, his old wave album uh, wasn't uh, wasn't even released uh, in the, in the U.S. and in much of the world. It was uh, I think West Germany and Canada uh, were the uh, the only two markets where it was actually actually released. And by uh, by late in the 80s, his uh, his his career appeared to be really in trouble. Plus, he was uh, he was pretty much in trouble personally and it was in uh, late 1988 that uh, that he and uh, and Barbara uh, went into uh, went into rehab and he stopped drinking which had been a major problem for him for you know the better part of uh, you know at least two decades and uh, and uh, stopped smoking by 1990 and uh, and the year before that, in 1989, he uh, came out of rehab and uh, went uh, went back on the road, and uh, for the first time since uh, since the Beatle years, uh, with uh, with this uh, new concept called the All Star Band, and it has been um, you know very very successful. You know, is you know, okay. He's not playing. He's not playing stadiums in the way that that Paul is, mm-hmm. but he's been consistently successful with uh, with the various lineups of the All Star Band over the uh, over the years. So, um, and uh, and that's certainly. Now, obviously, there you know his his record sales have not been have not been all that great, but I think just the mere fact that the all-star band has continued to be such a success and um, uh, so uh, such a dependable, uh, not coming up with the phrase. Act? act. Uh, yeah, a, a dependable act uh, shows, again, the, the resiliency of, of that has been the hallmark of Ringo's of Ringo's career and his uh, and his life. So I would say resiliency is the word that I would use. Okay. Okay, Ken. I'm gonna have to go with, and again, I wish it had something more to do with actual songs, uh, because there's no doubt about it. Certain songs like "It Don't Come Easy" and "Photograph" are classics, but I think he's probably <laughs> gonna best be known for the All Star Band tours. Because mm-hmm. like you said, Al, they've been a huge success, and more importantly, for a long time, ever since 1989. So now we're talking, uh, how many years is that? Uh, 20, 28 years. Yeah, where he's been every two, three years, he's on the road, and actually in the last few years, it's been every year. Pretty constant, um, yeah. Yeah, and everywhere he goes, he sells out. And like you said, Al, no, he's not playing stadiums. But he plays anywhere from, you know, 3,000 seat venues to, you know, 10,000 seat venues. And he does Mm -hmm. well, consistently. And, you know, I don't think that the average person studies the history like we do. And they may not know everything that you just went through uh, Mm -hmm. with all the problems that Ringo had with, uh, you know, the alcoholism and all and that he was in rehab. You know, I, I... and also just going through his whole history from 1970 onward. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the average person doesn't know that Ringo had seven top ten hits in America. You know, mm-hmm. I think, uh, but if they've been following the tour circuit in the last almost 30 years, Ringo's been around. And everyone that I've known that has gone to see him that's just a casual fan is blown away at how much they enjoy the show. So I think that's something that will stick out in their memory more so than buying a specific Ringo album, although, you know, as much as there's a lot of Ringo albums that I consider to be his best, most people would point to the Ringo album. I think that mm-hmm. the all-star band concept and all these wonderful lineups that he's had through the years, each one of them special in their own way, people walk away. So many people who don't even buy Ringo's music go to see him right. live. Mm-hmm. And they do so because they enjoy it so much and... 
up until this recent lineup that he's had for like four years or five years, they've been there's been a different lineup. So that keeps it interesting too. So mm-hmm. um, you know the fact nobody would have ever guessed in 1989 that Ringo would be doing this for so long and so consistently, but he has to his credit. Yeah. So I yeah. think that kind of overshadows even you know the su- the success that he's had with the record sales of the first five six years of his solo career. So I would pick mm-hmm. the All Star Band, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can I can absolutely see that because uh, you know the the concept that he that he set up uh, at the very at the very beginning. You know the uh, the songs the songs you know and love. Mm-hmm. You know if you go to see the All Star Band. You know, you're going to be hearing a, a goodly portion of songs that you know and love. Mm-hmm. Definitely. All right. Alan, how about you? Yeah, in, in, in a way, I agree uh, with Ken. Um, I pretty much agree with Ken, um, although I think I would, would have put it differently instead of, of saying the all-star band as such. I would think that what will stand out in Ringo's career um, as people look back at it, say, 20, 30 years from now, is the year 1989. Mm. Because we didn't know in 1988 that he went into rehab, but we found out about that in 89, and he did his uh, first new album in a very long time and put the all-star band together and went out on tour. And, uh, and so that's where my answer collides with Ken's, you know, because it's the start of the all-star band. But I think that because it was the start, it was especially important. It wasn't necessarily the best of the all-star bands, but it was like, it was a new concept. It was Ringo getting out there. It was Ringo playing basically shows of his own, although they were collaborative and, uh, and you know, and Time Takes Time was uh, pretty good, too, and, you know, showed that he was back. I mean, it was a consistently good album. And, uh, you know, and, and the albums he's done since have been uh, – a lot of people seem to overlook them. As Ken says, even people mm-hmm. who go to his shows don't necessarily pick up the records. But, you mm-hmm. know, they've been pretty steadily solid albums mm-hmm. through – know through Mm -hmm. since since then so um yeah so i I think of 1989 is kind of like a a a banner year for ringo and i think that when you look back at his career that's going to stand out as you know sort of a in a way the most important period or you know just sort of expanse of time for him Mm -hmm. that's when he turned his life around mm -hmm. yeah yeah and also that particular that first all-star band is a very special one. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because Clarence well, Clemens and yeah, Levon uh, Helm and right. Mm-hmm. Un- un- unfortunately, four four members of that All Star Band are uh, are gone now. Mm-hmm. But it was uh, it was a very very special collection mm-hmm. of uh, of musicians. I was uh, watching La- La- uh, Last Waltz the other day, and I was thinking about uh, Levon Helm and and and. Uh, Rick Manuel and, and uh, uh, Rick Danko. Danko and yeah, yeah. so mm. right. Yeah. I think they've all been special. Right. Yes. in their own way. Mm-hmm. What, but, you, know, you all, mean all the all the All Star bands? All the All Star bands have been special. Uh, I I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I would say some more than some definitely more than others. Well, you're gonna have your <laughs> favorites. You're bound to do that. Hmm. I wouldn't say they're. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they're all special though. They're definitely. The ones that didn't have Mark Farner in them were pretty special. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, wasn't wasn't uh, Billy Preston one of the ones with Farner? Because if that's the case, no, uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that route. But in any event, yeah. Okay, okay Steve. Um, I'm kind of going on what Alan said about 1989, but I pinpointed it a little more, and and, and I think Ken said the same thing about turning his life around. I think there are entertainers who a few entertainers who have turned their um life around as well as he has and um i'm thinking of um was it robert um god the actor um who who started in chaplin um oh robert downey jr robert downey oh downey. yes yeah right uh, there are uh, there are a few actors that have or a few entertainers that have done it as successfully 
uh, you know, as they have. And, and Downey Jr. did it and Ringo did it. And actually, when you see Ringo nowadays and you see him do the jumping jacks at the end of the shows, you know, you just have to kind of drop your mouth and go, oh, my God, how old is this guy now? But I mean, mm-hmm. he really he really has done it. Um, and he's, you know, he's t- he's talked about it. In fact, I, pu- I pulled up a quote, said, I got involved with a lot of different medications and you can listen to my records go downhill as the amount of medication went up. I've got photographs mm-hmm. of me playing all over the world, but I absolutely have no memory of it. I played Washington with the Beach Boys or so they tell me, mm. which is amazing because that show is one of the probably the most memorable shows, you know, that I can recall him doing because it was on television and he doesn't remember that. Yeah, but, but if you look but, at him, if you if you look at the tape of that show and you look at him, oh boy, I haven't seen he's, that one. He's 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 gone. I haven't, he's... Seen, <laughs> I haven't seen it. And he also and and, and I th- this is interesting because I do not remember this at all. And uh, and uh, he actually confessed to being a wife beater. Do you guys remember that? He said he he actually beat up Barbara. Um, no. it, but I'm not a violent man, but I was getting violent and it was just painful waking up in the morning and starting drinking again. But in any event, mm-hmm. he has turned his life around. And that's, I think, if anything, th- that should be what he's remembered for. Uh, granted, the, the all-star band was a, is a great, is a great thing. But it really is kind of a, a really kind of a gimmicky thing. Um, I don't, for the same reason that I don't think you'll remember Flo and Eddie for the Happy Together tour. I don't think Ringo will get remembered for so much for the All Star Band as for getting his getting his act together. Um, because mm-hmm. of the, the Happy Together tour is basically the same thing. And, and there's been a whole bunch of bands or a whole bunch of acts that have done those kind of tours you know with with uh the same musicians or with you know i mean basically the all-star band started off as a gimmicky thing to get him out on tour and it it worked better i think than he even expected but i i think really you have to give him credit for the for turning his life around i think Mm -hmm. that's really really what it comes down to well there's a plays which plays into the resiliency that i mentioned before ken i'm sorry yeah yeah, well, there are a few things that Steve just said that I don't agree with at all. <laughs> oh, and, like uh, uh, you know, I don't look at the All-Star Band as being gimmicky or, or even starting out as gimmicky. Um, I do think this is something that Ringo takes seriously. And kind well, of like I, think, what, what, I think he does now. I don't think I don't think it started. I mean, it, I don't think it started out that way. Well, he didn't um, know. He certainly didn't know when he started doing this that he was going to keep doing it. But he found mm. out that he enjoyed it. And part of what Ringo's gone through in all these years is to discover who he is. And it's kind of like what George Harrison has said, our purpose in life is to discover who we are and why we're here. Ringo figured that out. You know, throughout the, f- the first two decades of his solo career, he was doing, uh, he was making records and he was acting. And, you know, maybe he got bogged down in the acting. You know, he didn't really know exactly how to handle his career. And... Uh, it disappointed him when he didn't have the record sales that he wanted to have. And, um, you know, I just think that he finally discovered, as he has said many times, that he's a musician. And what he enjoys doing most of all is making music with his friends, whether it's in the studio or live. And now mm-hmm. it's become, you know, an important part of his life. And it, he, the fact that he continued to do it all these years is proof of that. So that's part well, of who he is. That's that's his whole... that's. That's part of his reason for being, as well as having, you know, Barbara and having his family. The the, the whole, and I don't want to get into a long argument about the All Star Band, but I mean, it was it was basically the same kind of thing that David Fishoff had done with other people, and it and the only reason why, or I shouldn't say the only reason, but Ringo, the the first All Star Band had such great people in it, it worked much better than I think anybody expected. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason that, I mean, you, you've seen other, like I said, other people have used the same concept and it hasn't worked out as well for them as it has for Ringo. It's worked out well for Ringo because Ringo has had tremendous lineups through the years of very talented people 
who mm-hmm. each have a few songs that everybody knows. And so it's kind of like Ringo said, it's the songs you know and love. And it's all right. how they all blend well together. All of the lineups have been really stellar lineups, certainly in my opinion. There's nothing no, wrong with I, having I, your favorites. Well, I disagree with that. I've enjoyed I, every I, single one of these All Star bands. I don't think I don't think every single one. I think there are some that are very much better than others. Well, you're always starting, going to say that. Everybody has starting favorites. starting hmm. with the starting with the '89. No, I think there's a de- definite. I think anybody's going to argue. There are there's been criticism of the current band. There's I been, think no, if there's, there's criticism, been, it's mainly because he's kept the same band for so long, and people want to see a change. Mm, I, I, yeah, I, that, that, I disagree there a little bit because I think there, I think there are other. I mean, well, all right, but um, yeah, okay. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Al, Alan, what do you, what do you guys think? Um, <laughs> I know. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I've only seen. I have not. Unlike Ken, I haven't seen all of the All Star Band uh, tours. I've been mm-hmm. uh, more more selective, let's put it that way, for various and sundry reasons. I haven't seen um, them all either. I've seen most. Of, I've know, seen a good number of them. I don't know how many off but, the top of my but, head. But I could. But I certainly understand Ken's point that uh, that you know that there's that there's something to like about all of the different all-star bands including including this one and uh and it is it is true that the the people that seem to be complaining the most now are people that are saying that well he's just playing with the same people over and over again you know hey paul mccartney has been playing with the same people over and over again for 16 years Mm -hmm. so and uh you know other than a couple of people uh, nobody seems to be really complaining about that I, I, I think I think the the issue with the, with the all stars is not is more the material really because the that first band for example had I mean when you have people playing the night they drove old Dixie down and, and right and, but there are you know but each each band has had you know there have been people like Dave Edmonds and Ian Hunter mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Peter Frampton and Sheila. You know, Ed- Sheila E, et cetera, et cetera. So each band has had something going for it. So you can't just, I mean, the, the, the 89 band absolutely was very special, but, uh, but you can't just say that, you know, just because that band was special that all the others weren't. No, I'm so, not, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm so, saying there are, uh, you know, uh, I would not say, however, that every, uh, that all all-star bands are created equal. Definitely I not. I didn't say that. I just said they're no, all I, great. Right. Uh, I, I still think you're being a little too. Uh, I, I wouldn't say all great. I would say good. I wouldn't say all great. Well, we have a difference of opinion, and I've been to right. every single tour. And I think right. part of the reason why you feel the way you do, Steve, is because you have a preference for certain eras of music. You're probably not going to be all that crazy about the '80s artists that that Ringo. Which has which, ones, you, na- which probably, ones? are you talking about? Probably, probably um, say Steve Lukather. Someone like that, or Howard Jones. I did. You know? I have to say, I did not see the Howard Jones oh, band. That, that was I my loved, favorite tour. I loved the uh, Gary Brooker, Ian Hunter tour. I absolutely adored that. I loved all the tours that Sheila E was on. Mm-hmm. She was she was spectac- spectacular. Right. Um, well, I did actually, not see Sheila Eric E. Carm- Sheila E was in the tour with Howard Jones. I, well, I didn't see the one. The one with I didn't see. I, at least I don't recall if I saw the Howard Jones one. I know I saw at least one with her. So well, she I, was she was in three tours, three different right. lineups. I can't remember how many I saw with her. I think I saw two. Well, two you, out of the what three. I'm saying is you tend to lean towards the '60s and '70s artists. Those are your favorites. Mm, well, yeah. Whatever. Well, I mean, well, I've, I've, I've seen. An, uh, I, I mean, it's just. Some of them, I think, are better are better than others. I think that's just the way it, it has been. Okay, and, and um, what's what's better for you may not be better for me. We have a difference of opinion. That's yeah, all right, but I, well, I wouldn't necessarily judge, you know, what my feelings are based on what you think my feelings are. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. I think I know what your feelings are after working with you for four years. I. I... <laughs> we, well, we've gone never... we've gone pretty far off the track here yeah. and why don't yeah. we get back on the track hmm. 
And um, why don't we turn to Paul McCartney? <laughs> Thank you. And um, I'm going to be fairly quick because uh, we're running long as usual. My my one word that I think Paul is going to be most remembered for is very simply songcraft. Uh, you know, ob- obviously you're talking about somebody who was who by the time the Beatles ended was already one of the greatest songwriters of all time. And then you add, you know, all of the endless number of great songs that he's, uh, that he's put out in the years uh, since then. In fact, you know, some years ago in, in Beatle fan, I said that, uh, that I considered Paul McCartney to be the greatest uh, writer of pop songs in the second half of the 20th century and in uh, the first, uh, you know, uh, with the glaring exception of Driving Rain, in the mm-hmm. first uh, Could you know, I edit that decade... out? Could I edit that out? No. <laughs> <laughs> in the first uh, decade and a half of uh, of this new century, I think he's done some uh, some some great work. But what's what's most special about Paul McCartney as a songwriter is that he has this ability and not every not every songwriter can do this. He has the ability to come up with these these earworms, these hooks that worm their way into your subconscious. And three days later, you'll hear, you know, you'll hear a song and all of a sudden, three days later, you'll realize that you've been, you know, half humming, half singing Hope of Deliverance, you know, or, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or Wonderful Christmas Time or... Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, or, I sing or, that one or, all the time. Right, of course, right. Mm-hmm. You know, or silly love songs, or uh, you know, or only love remains, or mm-hmm. you know, any number of uh, uh, any number of other songs uh, that you've been singing to that to you, uh, them to yourself for three days. You know, he's uh, that's you know that's a uh, that's a that's a real gift, mm-hmm. and he's uh, he's just a uh, he's a consummate songwriter. You know, there's no no question about it. Even if sometimes his lyrics are not the not the greatest, he he has the ability to come up with uh, with melodies that are just outstanding. Is is a you know is a is a total understatement, but that's that's the way. Uh, that's uh, I think a, a pretty good description. So I would say songcraft would be what what Paul McCartney is probably best uh, best known for. Hmm. Ken? Well, I would agree with everything you just said, although I would say that encompasses in t- his entire career, not just his solo career. Oh, oh, absolutely, but that we're talking about his solo career. As I said, you know, by the time the Beatles ended, he was already one of the greatest songwriters of hmm. the 20th century. Uh, but uh, but we're talking strictly about the the solo career. Okay. Well, for me, Paul was definitely the most difficult to come up with because he's put out so much music, well over 30 albums. He's done so many different things. And, you know, like I said, I'm thinking more in terms of the mainstream public. I'm thinking more of people who don't know history that well and certainly don't know most of his catalog and maybe only know a handful of hits or a Mm -hmm. few things like Band on the Run. But um, whereas there's so many great songs that he's given us through the years and great albums... I still think, kind of like Ringo, that he's going to be known for his tours because he puts together the greatest shows, two and a half to three hours long. And he's got this incredible wealth of material to draw from. And whereas I wish that he didn't rely so much on the Beatles, he does have so much music to pull from. And he's still doing great concerts and Despite the fact that, as we've said, his voice isn't exactly what it used to be, he still mm-hmm. puts on a great show. He gives you, you know, it's an amazing show from start to finish. Even though there may not be that many changes from tour to tour, I still love every single show I've ever seen from him. So I think the fact that he's toured the world so much, so many people have seen him live, most people that have seen him are thoroughly impressed. If they don't think he's one of the best perform, he, they either think it's one of it's either the best show or one of the best shows they've ever seen. And in my opinion, I don't I, the fact that he 
jumps around from piano to bass to acoustic guitar to electric guitar. It makes it even more interesting. When you take a look at all the different tours that he's done, from the Wings tours all the way on up, you know, he's one of the greatest live performers we've ever had. And, um, you know, I'd love to just single out a song, because, you know, I could just as easily say Band on the Run, if I want to. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, like I said, I'm thinking in terms of the average Joe out there who doesn't know this full scope of music that he's done, don't know how rich in variety it is don't know all the great b-sides that he's put out you know all that stuff they go to see his shows they're blown away even if they don't know you know his newest album even if they haven't mm -hmm. even if they haven't bought most of his solo music i think the shows that paul has put on uh, are just really amazing you know and the yeah. fact that he's been doing it consistently every single year now for several years and probably will keep doing it probably less and less with each year but that alone is just so amazing to me. Now, let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. Uh -huh. uh, you're talking about somebody who just within the last year filled up four CDs of what at least he and his, uh, his team consider a good portion of his best material, uh -huh. his, his best recorded material. And yet, you th and yet you think that it's the live performances that are of what uh, what he's best known for. I think that because of his stature, because of all that he's done, Beatles and solo, people know that he's a great performer and a great entertainer, and he puts on a great show. And mm -hmm. I don't really look at Pure McCartney as being something that was devised as a best of Paul McCartney. I think this was a set list that Paul put together that were personal favorites of his. And yes, there were hits on there. But they are not necessarily, they're not what I would, I would put together as a greatest hits or best of compilation, although a lot of those songs I would put in there. But, right. but I think that to the average person, again, I'm talking average person out there that doesn't mm -hmm. know most of his music, that may not know all the album cuts on Pure McCartney, <laughs> they are going to know most of the songs from his solo career that he does live. They will know 1985, you know, mm -hmm. because it does get some airplay on rock radio not a lot they'll know let me roll it because that still gets airplay on classic rock radio not as much as band on the run or jet but even the deeper cuts what what he considers deeper cuts are fairly well known to an average audience so i think that if you're going out to have a good time if you want to see someone who's putting on a great show that encompasses his whole career even though like i said a little too weighted for me in the beatles Paul McCartney is one of the absolute greatest performers and entertainers we have ever had in music, period. And he gives you your money's worth every time. So I think that's what most people will remember him for, because he's also toured the world in a lot of mm -hmm. different locations. It's not just the U.S. and Japan. He's played in South America, parts of Europe. He hasn't played Australia for a long time, I know. I was just going to say that. <laughs> you know, but he has, he has tackled, you know, most of the world. <laughs> even Russia you know mm -hmm. so that's what I think I would prefer if it was more the solo catalog of his of his work but he's so damn good as a performer he really he you know he knows how to turn it on he knows how to win an audience and he does it consistently and he still is doing it he will sell out every show that that he that he does for the rest of his life and there's a reason for that. It's a combination of who he is and how great a show he does. Okay. Uh, Alan? Okay. I think I'm going to uh, take the Al approach this time and come up with one word uh, that I think people will think of him in terms of, and that word is facility. And facility is a double-edged sword. <laughs> Uh, the upside of it is exactly what Al said about the ability to, at the drop of a hat, come up with an earworm, you know, come mm -hmm. up with a hook that that is going to stay in your mind. And that is a gift. And the downside of it is that because it's so easy for him, um, I think he signs off on a lot of stuff that maybe 
would be better if he worked a bit harder at it. You know, you get the, and he talks a lot of the time about how, yeah, yeah, you know, when we went in with the Beatles, we thought, you know, if we, if we can't get it done in two hours, you know, writing a song, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not worth it. Well, you know, that's not a rule. (laughs) What is that? You know, and if you have, you know, some of these songs where the lyrics are, are just not quite, up there you know i mean they're okay but they're not you know they could be better you kind of think if he made it three hours maybe it would have been and also because of this facility there's this you know this this discussion that that actually he and i had when i interviewed him in 1990 where i said you know why is it that sometimes stuff on your b-sides that you know people just don't get necessarily if they buy the album and you know, not necessarily the single. Uh, sometimes the stuff on the B sides is better than things on the album. And what I was thinking of, for instance, was uh, flying to my home as mm-hmm. opposed to Ue Le Soleil. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like why wasn't flying to my home on that album? You know, that was a, it's a great song. And Ue Le Soleil. I mean, I don't know. You know, that's you. Like, that's how you feel. That's how you feel. That's how I feel. And of course, my opinion is really the only one that matters. But um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> this is how music critics are trained to think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but you know, and 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 what he said was, you know, here's the thing: I write them all, and I like them all, so I can't really judge which ones are the best. And so I play them for my kids and my kids' friends, and I sort of go what. what they, uh, you know, are, are telling me, and I, I, I'm not sure if he was being totally accurate about that. But if he was, I, I, I found that kind of a shocking answer because part of being an artist is the ability to edit and the ability to sift the wheat from the chaff. And, and I think that because things come so easily to him, and that a lot of his quote bad stuff is still an awful lot better than a lot of people's good stuff. <laughs> That's true. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he he accepts it and and uh, and and has trouble sort of saying, okay, but this is really the top drawer stuff. This is what should go on the album. So again, it's it's facility and it has it has a an upside and a downside, but it's definitely I think a word that people so will associate with Paul when they see you know how incredibly prolific he is and and how, and how much of it is actually pretty good stuff you know I think what Paul was telling you was truthful though I think he does rely on his family and his friends and I remember when when your favorite album Al Driving Rain came out and Paul picked the single from a lover to a friend he said uh-huh. that was a favorite of Ringo's so Ringo had told him that he liked the song, so maybe that was the reason why he made it a single. So he relies mm-hmm. on the judgment of the people around him sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And certainly, certainly his family is not going to lie to him, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, or, or his closest friends are not going to. It doesn't mean that what they're saying is correct, but you know, right. it's all opinion as to what we think are his best work. Flowers in the Dirt and Off the Ground could have easily have been double albums. Mm-hmm. Once you see, once you hear all the bonus material, so there you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, very true. Steve, um, again, Alan and I are thinking pretty much along the same wavelength. Um, but I went out a little, a little further. I think the one thing about McCartney that will be remembered is his his going out, uh, his uh, experimenting with all forms of artistic uh, artistic expression i mean he's been a poet he's been a painter he's been a classical composer he's done avant-garde as well as uh, the as well as rock and roll and and the you know his music hooks uh, are are you know without question they were they're great but i mean his just all around uh going out and and doing everything and some of it, I mean, he hasn't been successful in every instance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the pain, I don't think the painting worked. I don't think the poetry worked. Um, but um, I, I do think that he, there was a whole lot of 
there's I mean the fact that he's been out there and he's been so versatile I think that's probably pretty amazing one thing I was going to bring up I happened to be scouting around on Hulu the other day and Hulu has and I didn't even know it existed there's a documentary called The Art of McCartney about the making of that album oh, which yeah. I mm-hmm. which I did not like I I mean I we t- when we had to the show I I dumped on the album cuz I really didn't think it was that great but hearing mm-hmm the artists talk about McCartney and hearing the little excerpts from the songs rather than the full, the full song actually worked better for me than hearing the album. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I want to recommend to anybody that has Hulu to check that out. Uh, It's, uh, it's pretty interesting, but it, Mm -hmm. it, and that kind of goes along with, you know, uh, his, his uh, talent, the way it's been so, um, you know, it's been so amazing and it's been so wide open. I mean, the way he's gone and done so many things. Uh, again, not all of it has worked, but I think that really is what people will, will remember. I, I I do agree about the about his talent for musical hooks. There's no absolutely no question. I almost kind of wish I had thought of that, and I and I didn't. But the first thing that came to mind was, you know, his uh, going out and trying all these things. And, and being so expressive in so many areas and not being afraid to dip his toes in in uh, in things. I, I'm frankly, when he first started doing classical and when Liverpool Oratorio came out, I kind of cringed. Um, and I over the over time, I've gotten I've felt better about his classical stuff. But um, but the fact that he tried that uh, and he has tried so many different things, ballet, I mean, you know, I mean, that's really kind of, you know, that you got to give him credit, even if he hasn't, if it hasn't worked, he hasn't been afraid to get out there and try it. So, well, like I said, we all have different opinions and like you just were talking about his classical music that you like it a little bit better now than you first did. Also, he did ambient music with uh, with the fireman. You know, and all the different styles that he's done. But again, you're relying on people to know all this information. And the the mm. average person, I think, doesn't know all that. They know he was a Beatle. They know he had some hits on his own. A lot of hits, really. But the average person doesn't know. No, I think I know. think people that are listening to us know pretty well, much Well, that's, pretty much that's stuff. our listeners. I'm talking about the average person out there. Well, I think if you... If, as a as a journalist, if I'm writing his obituary, or when I'm writing his obituary, that's going to get mentioned that he dipped his toes in all sorts of different areas, and I think that's that was one of the considerations that I was thinking of as far as the show goes. You know, what 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 will I, you know, if if and when the time comes, what will I have to consider as far as you know remembering them, and that would be the thing that. Uh, one of the things that I would that I would point out. Mm-hmm. So, it's well, a, it's ex- really an important thing, though. That's what stands out for me when you're talking about Paul. But then I'm not the average person, so. Right. Well, we know that. <laughs> right. And plus, and plus, you know, if when you are going to do the you know the obit, there is actually one thing that he'll obviously be known for more than anything else, and that's obviously having been a Beatle. Well, obviously, obviously, uh-huh. but we were, but we weren't talking about right about yes, right, right. So. exactly, right. Mm-hmm. And 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 one other one other thing that just comes out off the top of my head is the fact that his kids have turned out to be so relatively successful. You got Stella, who really, you know, has has made a mark for herself. You got Mary, who's a great photographer, and you got James, who is not what I would call a big success as a musician yet, but he's, you know, he's been plugging hard away at it. So, you know, right. But that has, that has nothing to do with, with his, you know, with his, his no, no, absolutely. No, no, but I think I, I do think that the, the fact that he's been so, you know, that he has been so well-rounded and so uh, uh, willing to try things. I think, um, I think you have to give him credit for that. Mm-hmm. He always was that way. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Yep, absolutely. So that's, yeah, that's, as I kind of expected, that's four actually pretty uh, diverse, uh, pretty, pretty disparate uh, views right. of, right. Uh, of uh, what, uh, what Paul McCartney is going to be most remembered for. Well, we are, of course, as usual, way over time. So we're going to quickly just give you our contact information and, uh, uh, and uh, then put this one to rest. <laughs> And uh, Steve, how do people get in touch with us? People can get in touch with us by writing Things We Said Today uh, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today Beatles fans. Uh, we have a Twitter account, Things We Said Fab. Um, and you can get a hold of me by writing Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. I have a Facebook page and a Beatles news and commentary news group. And there I said it very quickly. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Ken? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I would like to mention one quick thing that I will have a special contest coming up probably by this Friday. And I'll be giving away a few of the newly remastered uh, vinyl albums from uh, the George Harrison uh, vinyl box set. A few of them, not the whole box mm-hmm. set, a few of the titles. So uh, check out the website for that, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay. And Alan, how do uh, people get in touch with you? Um, either through the group email or um, on my Facebook page, which is Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. There's another one. That's probably the best way. Okay. And uh, similar with me, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, Twitter at ASUSS49, uh, or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. The new issue was in my mailbox this afternoon. Uh, and uh, and also, uh, in about 48 hours, I'm going to be on my way to my old uh, my old homestead in, uh, in New York and New Jersey, and we'll be uh, in Jersey City uh, for the, uh, the Fest for Beatles fans this, mm-hmm. uh, this weekend, as will Ken. Uh, Ken will be there on Saturday, right. and he'll be uh, he'll be participating in a uh, Beatles radio forum uh, early in the afternoon and uh, early in the evening. Uh, he'll be doing a uh, uh, having a discussion with Kid O'Toole about uh, buried treasures from the solo years, mm-hmm. and uh, and then a little bit later he'll be he and uh, our friend Darren DeVivo uh, will be uh, interviewing uh, uh, Gary. Uh, uh, Gary Van Syak and Adam Ippolito from uh, from Elephant's Memory. So Ken will be there on Saturday. I'll be there the whole weekend. Uh, like I said, they they roll me out with the uh, with the furniture, <laughs> and that's um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the uh, the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City, on the Hudson. Uh, <laughs> And hope we'll. And if you uh, if you're going to be there, please, if you see me in the hall, trip me uh, or stop by, uh, uh, especially the Act Naturally stage where I'll be much of the uh, much of the weekend. And uh, as I said, uh, this was a <laughs> as usual a full a a, a fully packed uh, edition of things we said today. And we thank you for listening. And uh, for. Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci. This is Al Sussman. Again, thanks for listening to things we said today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.